like there's no tomorrow. Hey! Welcome everyone after the break. Uh, in this block we will discuss the remaining three subjects of the lecture. So uh, as already promised before, today we will concentrate on simulating uh, short rate models and observing, um, measuring the dynamics of a yield curve uh, obtained from the models. So in the video from the previous block we have uh, seen a, a real market simulation. So there was a Fed fund and for each uh, value of a Fed fund we have observed a forward-looking curve, yield curve. Uh, today we will try to replicate that uh, observation using short rate models. And then by looking at the paths or looking at the yield curve implied from the model, we will try to conclude whether the dynamics of a yield curve is it realistic or it's not, especially from the risk management perspective. So those are three uh, blocks we are going to discuss today. Uh, I will finish this lecture with extra homework, so not extra, but homework, with two exercises, and I hope you will have a, you will have a good time. In the experiment we have seen a few seconds ago, uh, we have observed the dynamics of the Fed fund, so we can see a uh, movement of the short rate. This is how typically we associate the short rate with the Fed fund. And for every, let's say, movement in a short rate, we have observed, we have observed the dynamics of a yield curve. Uh, this was kind of entertaining and also um, telling us a lot about the possible movements of a yield curve. What is important to keep in mind that uh, yield curve, you have seen it, it's not very static. It moves, it's really uh, behaving very dynamically. Um, yield curve, it's an essentially an expectation of a possible, uh, what is the market sees as an expectation of a yields in the future. So it is, if you think of a Monte Carlo simulation, in a simulation we can typically simulate 10,000 or more different scenarios. Uh, and market essentially does the same. So there are multiple scenarios, multiple different uh, so different investors, they have different perception, what is the future realization? So let's say everyone has his own ex uh, expectation about the market. And once people do the trading, they buy and sell derivatives from each other, that determines the, uh, the price. And that is basically the average, the expectation of market about the future rates. And of course, it's driven by supply and demand, but this is also it's indicative of the average and market expectation of a future yield curves. So this is very nice. And now we would like to uh, replicate that experiment, re replicate that observation, real observation, with a simulation using the whole white model. Uh, so what we are going to do, we are going to perform an experiment in which we observe the dynamics of the continuously compounding rate. So again, this, this, again, this will be a, a, a rate associated with a zero coupon bond minus, here we have a T, T, this RTT, this is just for notation, just to make clear that we separate from the R, but this will be R and then we have a T minus T. So we are looking at the yield curve. The objective in this experiment is to simulate short rates and compute continuously compounded rates uh, for each realization of R. So this is, uh, uh, as we have seen already in this experiment, uh, we have seen a path, let's say, until, let's say, 10 years. This is in our experiment. And at this point, we are going to simulate a uh, generate yield curve as uh, driven by the whole white model. So here we will have a yield curve like this. If we have a second path, so we have second Monte Carlo simulation, we have a second yield curve and so on. So for example, 10,000, essentially we can think of a 10,000 different scenarios for yield curves. And, and that's just, hopefully that will be similar what we have seen already in the simulation um, just we, we just um, seen uh, in the previous block. Um, and this is very also illustrative because this also tells us what is the dynamics of the yield curve given the short rate model of full white. So given these different shapes of a yield curve, we can conclude whether this model is realistic or it's not. Um, also something to keep in mind that this process RT depends on function function theta t. So we have this uh, at this point, um, once we talk about this yield curve here, this will be also implied by this uh, theta t function, which we have used from today's term structure. Um, in this experiment actually that we are going to perform, I have used the real market data, so we don't have any more simplistic interest rate, let's say of one or 
But now I have just taken real market data and I will also illustrate how this can be incorporated in the simulation of the short trades. Um, so in the approach here, um, um, it's often used for the risk computations, uh, where for each simulated market scenario, yield curve is generated. So in the risk analysis, what happens typically, we have uh, we simulate different scenarios. And for each scenario, we uh, generate a yield curve. And then given that yield curve, so for example, if we are in this particular scenario, we generated this yield curve, then this yield curve can be used to evaluate a portfolio of interest rate products. So for example, here we will have a, a, a sum of all that we will have PV1, PV1 depending on this yield curve. We can also take this scenario, we will have a PV2, PV2, and we have a PV3 and so on. So we can have a whole distribution on different uh, present values of our portfolio. And if you look at this distribution, we can also quantify some measures. And that's also very useful in the risk management, where basically, uh, for example, VAR calculations can be based on uh, VAR calculations or historical VAR calculations we will discuss later in this course, so maybe it's not relevant uh, at this point. However, it is kind of, I would say, it's a very nice experiment where we can see the dynamics of the curve and we can actually see how this short rate paths are affected by the different market scenarios and also what is the how this curve actually moves under the assumption of the full white mode. Uh, in the simulation, so this is the, the result. Uh, in a few minutes, we'll go to Python code. We will um, go through step by step uh, how this can be generated. So in this experiment, I have simulated a number of paths. You see th those paths are from simulated from time T0 until uh, 10 years. And for each of those paths, I have computed this R. So I have first generated zero coupon bonds, T. So this will be actually, so the most exact here will be 10 years, we have a TI, and for different, so T11, T12, 12, and so on. And from those zero coupon bonds, I have computed R. So it'll be R uh, for first bond, for second bond, and so, so it's R. Well, let's call it R, I, uh, R, I2, and so on. And then if we plot all those yields, essentially we can. Uh, just to look at the dynamics, how this yield will look like if the scenario, if the simulated short rate would be here. Um, what is interesting here is also one of the big disadvantages of the whole white model is that uh, all those yield curves generated by whole white, they're really just a parallel shift of each other. So for example, if we have one path here, we see a yield curve at this moment, if this is the scenario for yield curve. If we look at this path, which is a bit higher, you see this exactly the same curve, it's exactly the same shape, but it's just moved parallel. This is also what we have seen a few slides ago once we talked about the parallel shift of a yield curve. However, in practice, this is considered to be a very unrealistic scenario because maybe somebody would expect the yield curve, for example, this one to be like this, and the curve, which is here, to be like this. So there should be some intersection interaction between different forward rates. Because once we talk about the parallel uh, yields, uh, we also talk about the relation between forward rates. And you see there is a, basically a, a one correlation between different forward rates. In a few minutes, we will discuss in detail what does it mean, the one correlation between different forward rates. But at this, at this point, you can see that the, the whole white model, under the whole white model, uh, the yield which is implied for different scenarios it's just simply a, a parallel shift of a yield curve. So this is very important takeaway. Uh, let's take a look now on the Python code. So in this experiment, so let's look. Uh, in this experiment, so we start with the main function. I have defined a zero coupon bond curve. So this is uh, um, different uh, spine points. So we have a TIs and PIs. I have also defined uh, in order to um, get our yields or in order to get zero coupon bond P0T uh, at every possible time on T, you have defined interpolation. And this is uh, uh, here, I think it's a spline interpolation which I have used. Um, later in this course, we'll discuss uh, particular choices of different interpolations and their impact of, on the simulation. And, uh, but th this is now it's maybe not so important. Essentially, once you have different uh, spine points, so if you have those pairs of different points, 
uh, it is very important that you have interpolation uh, between those points. Otherwise, you cannot really have a zero coupon bond, which is necessary to use for calculation of function theta. Because function theta is calculated not on uh, spine points, it is basically continuous function. So this is very important that you have continuum in zero coupon bonds. And therefore, the uh, interpolation uh, is very important. Um, here, maybe uh, one more takeaway. Uh, what I have done here, I have interpolated on the logarithm. So um, I prefer to interpolate on the rate itself instead of an uh, exponent. That gives typically numerical stability. But we will discuss it later. Uh, what are the different choices for the interpolations? Um, OK, so here we have a different um, um, bonds. How many points bonds will calculate uh, from uh, a time 10 years until I think I have chosen here 49 years. So we have a time grid for different zero coupon bonds. So it's a 20, we will basically have 20 yields, um, 20 yield points for every scenario. Uh, what we do here, we calculate. So first we simulate. So this, this part is where we calculate just uh, uh, today's yield curve. So we see there is an R0. So we don't really rely on Monte Carlo paths. And we here just to do a kind of sanity check where we compare a zero coupon bond of today yield curve uh, to one obtained from the, uh, from the market. And we also calculate yield. So this is the first figure will be about uh, zero coupon bonds from obtained from the market and zero coupon bonds obtained from the simulation. Uh, and this is always the first step in the simulation. Once you deal with short rates and actually general in models, you have to make sure that you have recovered your yield curve. Although in under HJM framework, it is guaranteed that you have recovered your, frame, your yield curve, uh, but it's not guaranteed that your implementation is uh, bulletproof. So please always make sure that you have uh, that this, this kind of sanity check always stays. So you have uh, consistency, you are not having a bug anywhere here. Of course, your simulation will depend on number of paths and number of time steps. So if you see there is mismatch between the yield from the market and the zero coupon bonds obtained from simulation, maybe you should increase number of uh, simulated paths or number of time steps. And then the key element here, so this will be this part. So this is a uh, simulation of uh, uh, whole white. So we have simulated whole white until time 10 years. So we have 10 years uh, paths because we are only interested on the short rate because of the affinity of the model. We are only interested on in paths at time t10. This is the uh, the point that we need to have paths. And then those paths. So here I'm taking r from this uh, containing from this dictionary, and I'm going to use analytical expression for zero coupon bonds. You see, I'm having the uh, different, I'm iterating over the grid of time points. So if a T end, which is 10 years, and I have a TJ will be 11 and so until 49. And I'm using these paths at time T10. So this is RT, which will be the, the last vector of this matrix with uh, simulated paths. So this is the paths exactly at time T10. And then I'm using just the analytical expression for zero coupon bond which is here, so it's, uh, we already have seen it, it's A plus B times R T at T1. And then what we do next, so once we have zero coupon bonds, we uh, evaluate uh, yield. So we take a minus logarithm of zero coupon bond and then we adjust it to time. Because yield is not, uh, it's a unit less in terms of per year. So we always think of a yield per, per year. So if we have a bond for 30 years, we always have to divide by 30 because otherwise we have a very large number. Okay, so let's perform the simulation. So uh, before I show you the results, so first we see this is a zero coupon bonds obtained from Monte Carlo, so one factor model, and obtained from analytical expression. So this is this is I think is is perfectly fine. This is the yield curve, which is uh, generated from the market data from actually from the market data itself. So this is the yield curve we have done simulation here. So it's only, you see it's at R0. So this is today's yield curve as we have seen. It's uh, increasing and then stabilizes. You could say it's uh, maybe healthy, uh, but you can see also the rates are extremely low. So uh, this is not really desired. And then what we do here, we uh, I show you the simulated paths. So we have until time 10 years. We have simulated Monte Carlo paths of the full white model. And for all of these paths, generate 
yield, which is basically done in this line here. So we have a zero coupon bonds, and then we transfer those zero coupon bonds to get the yield. So you see the again, uh, although we, we may change the number of seed points. So for example, if I change, uh, let me see, I think I'm not even restarting seeds. So every time I'll get slightly different results. You see in the full white model, we always, always have this parallel shift between different yield curves. So whenever scenario you will have, you always have impact of this different scenario would be only on the parallel shift of the whole curve. And that's considered to be very unrealistic and very undesired in the risk management. Um, but you can see that actually this is a very nice experiment because it actually resembles what we have seen in this video, YouTube video, where we have seen, we have seen the real uh, short rate, we can say Fed fund. And then for each realization of a Fed fund, we have seen market expectation about the future rates, which was actually the yield curve at that particular date. And this is actually this kind of experiment uh, resembles what we have seen in reality. Of course, here would be also nicer to maybe uh, see it in time, but this is maybe too much for this. Uh, I think you can you understand what we have done so far, and I'm pretty sure you will be able to replicate it. Um, in the follow-up uh, book, we will extend this framework, so we will look at the, exactly what are the limitations of the full white model and how to improve it by adding additional uh, factor. Although the full white model is very elegant that we have already have learned from the EJM framework, uh, it is extremely useful compared to the equilibrium models as it allows us to calibrate directly to the whole yield curve, it also has some limitations. Some of the limitations we already have seen once we simulated uh, different yield curves for different uh, short rate scenarios. Uh, here is a little bit of summary. What are the motivations for the extension, possible extensions of the full white model? Um, so like I mentioned, it, although it's very elegant model, it does not allow and allows us to fit the whole entire curve it does not allow to fit the entire forward curve. So uh, we haven't discussed yet the forward curve. Uh, essentially, how you can think about it, if we have, uh, uh, right now we have a different maturity points, T1, T2, T3, uh, and so on. So we fitted a yield curve, so we fit at this point, we fit at this point, we fit at this point. So this is associated with the theta T function. However, forward uh, would be also, forward curve will be associated that we, at this point, we also calibrate it to this interval, at this interval, and so on. So it's not only this effective yield curve, so it's not only this effective interest rate, effective yield, but we also have those forwards. So something, let's say, decomposition of the effective uh, yield into the time-dependent yield. This is how you can uh, typically think about it. Um, this is limitation uh, for uh, actually most of the short rate models uh, in order to handle this problem, we will go further in this lecture, we will discuss the LIBOR market model where actually this forward curve and also yield curve is well addressed. Another big limitation of the full white model is that under the full white dynamics, zero coupon bonds are perfectly correlated. So if we have a two maturities, time T1 and time T2, and we consider two zero coupon bonds, so it's a PT1 and PT2, so if we illustrate by time, we have a some time in the future, we have a T1 and T2. We have a bond over this period and we have a second bond from T to T2. There is a correlation one of these two uh, bonds. Um, so how to see that? Let's, let's follow the definition of the zero coupon bonds under the full white framework. So we know that because it's, the model belongs to fine processes, we can express the zero coupon bond in the following form. We have this A and B, so it's an exponent A T1, A B T1 on T. And then for the second bond, we have a P T2. And then we have, oh, there's a small typo, it should be A T2, B T2 R T. So now what we can do, we can look at the correlation between uh, yields for these two bonds. So if we make the log transformation and we scale it with time, then we arrive at the following expression. So we have RT1, and we have this minus uh, time effect. Then we have 8T1, uh, BT1, RT. And for the second one, we have uh, RT2. And then we have, of course, the same time, it's a different time, but then we have a uh, uh, 8T2 function and BT2, RT. Uh, 
And actually, because it's actually a just linear combination of those, uh, uh, those are the deterministic functions. So the correlation between RT1 and RT2, it is simply one. And this is also what was we have observed in the dynamics of the yield curve, because there was no really um, dependence. So this curve, the, there was a parallel shift in the yield curve for given every Monte Carlo path. And that was also due to this correlation of one of different zero coupon bonds of the yields were perfectly uh, correlated. Later in this course, once we'll be talking about the LIBOR market model, it will be clear that this correlation, although very high, so often if we have bonds with maturities T1 and T2 very close by, then this correlation is rather high, maybe even more than 90%. But if we have a T1, let's say one year, and T2 is 30 year, then this correlation will be much lower, it will be, for example, 30%. However, in the full white framework, this correlation is always work, and that's significant disadvantage. This also we should not also expect too much because this, this is a single factor model, which is uh, allows us for perfect calibration to yield curve. It allows us to have two parameters to calibrate to the volatility surface, and uh, we should not expect that we are be able to calibrate to the whole term structure of different interest rates, and let's say maybe thirty dimensional even with a single factor model. That is. Uh, just impossible to achieve. And um, maybe one more uh, last comment that the results that we have here, uh, there are uh, the zero coupon bonds are fully correlated. Uh, this is also a big disadvantage if we talk about the risk management. So from risk management, we really want to have uh, realistic scenarios for zero coupon bonds, for actually short rates dynamics. Um, and why is, what's the reason? Typically, if we talk about risk management, people may choose some historical data, for example, simulation, and then we can see the yield curve dynamics and the correlations between the forward rates is not equal to one. So if we choose a model to simulate possible market scenarios, we really need to have a model which is realistic or which is better represents the reality than single uh, one factor model. And this is also the motivation why we should consider extension of the whole white model to two dimensions, to have additional round emotion. And that will be discussed in the following block. Um, maybe also we should not be uh, too optimistic by adding extra factors to whole white model. We may address some of the issues. For example, we may address the correlation issue, but it does not mean that we'll be able to calibrate perfectly to the whole term structure. And that's just impossible. So the Gaussian models, uh, especially those Gaussian two-factor, one-factor models, we can get some extra advantage, but we are not going to uh, address all the issues. If we also talk about the extension of the full white model to two dimensions, that's typically that model would not be used for pricing. It would be typically used for uh, uh, scenarios and, mar and uh, risk management. And because actually by adding additional factor, we essentially fixing this problem. We are not fixing the problem that we can calibrate the model to much more, let's say, exotic derivatives. We cannot fit the model still to the whole uh, cube of volatilities. Since the full white model has this significant limitation that uh, for different maturities, so zero coupon bonds with different maturities have correlation of one, uh, we need something better. We need an extension of the framework. Uh, the simplest extension we can think of is to include additional normal process to extend the single factor whole white model to multi factor whole white model, or in this case, two factor whole white model. Uh, the dynamics for such a process is given as follows. So we have a dynamics of a DRT, we have a time dependent function theta t, then we have a ut, which is essentially our second factor, which is defined here, and then we have this mean reversion parameter a. R, T, 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 and then there is a sigma D, W, T, 1. And for the process for U, T, we have this additional factor. Uh, we also, of course, importantly, we assume there's a correlation between two brown emotions. Uh, what's the interpretation? How to interpret uh, two factor models and how to relate it to uh, dynamics of a yield curve? Uh, typically, uh, the first factor is associated with a level of the yield curve. And the second vector, or second stochastic process, corresponds to the skewness of the yield. This will be later, uh, I think, hopefully clearer in the experiment. So what we are going to do 
we are going to describe the dynamics of the Hull-White two-factor model, Gaussian two-factor model, and later on we are going to experiment as we have done for the uh, single-factor Hull-White model, where we are going to uh, generate Monte Carlo paths using two-factor model, and at this point we are also going to generate yields implied from that model. And, uh, and then we will see whether the, let's say, whether for different set of parameters for a full white two factor, whether we are able to get something more than just parallel shift of a yield curve that was present in a single factor model, which we consider to be a significant limitation of the single factor uh, full white model. Um, and we also have this correlation, so there's a correlation between two brown emotions. Uh, keep in mind, uh, I will explain in a minute uh, why I have uh, put bar above rho. But there's a correlation rho bar between these two brown emotions. We can also reformulate the model into a uh, so-called affine form. So affine basically means it's a linear in the variables. We can express interest rates as the composition or the summation of uh, two stochastic factors. So you see that almost they look alike with a mean reversion A, sigma 1. And for the second process for X, we have a B, sigma 2. And we have a rather complicated or maybe deterministic function phi t. And this phi t, you see, is a different function than this theta t. So it's a, a more involved function of a theta t. Um, why I put this t bar here above correlation? So if you would like to move from this representation into this uh, affine form, those are the parameters which we're going to map. So from the mapping from this representation to this representation, some of the parameters will be different. And actually the correlation here and here slightly adjusted with, uh, uh, with the volatilities. Uh, so once you perform the mapping from one to another model, then you have to keep in mind that the meaning of the parameter is not the same. So the correlation here is not the same correlation there. I'm not going to provide to the details how to derive it because it's just uh, uh, algebraic expression, but once you talk about a Gaussian two-factor models or Hull-White two-factor models, keep in mind that you can easily uh, switch from one to another. There is, uh, from the numerical perspective, I would consider this model to be more attractive, uh, and the reason is as follows, is that we could simulate processes for X and Y without taking into account time-dependent parameter. So, this is beneficial, especially if you talk about the large time steps. We don't need to integrate this function uh, phi. We can directly just, uh, you see constant parameters. We have a version. We have constant parameters for volatility. So the simulation of x and y is independent of phi. Uh, realization for x and y, so we can just put together with function phi. And then we have a process for r. Uh, on the other hand, if we think of, a, just say, all the discretization of process r here, then we also need to take care of this uh, theta function. So this theta function um, this also is also in the single factor cool white model given in terms of zero coupon bonds, uh, but it also means that we may not be able to do very small time steps uh, because this function theta would, uh, pres preserves information from the yield curve. So if you want to do large time steps, that may be not possible in the uh, full white model in this representation because this information from theta t would be gone. So then in this case, uh, this representation is nicer. Of course, there are also possibilities how to simulate full white model two factor with large time steps without really uh, reliance on theta, but this is a general notion. So if you have a Monte Carlo simulation and you you see there is let's say less there is no time dependent parameters and processes allow you for large time steps, then this is typically preferred choice. Of course, if you start reformulating of the model, then you will also have this efficient implementation. But at the first glance, if I would choose between these two models, uh, I would go for this representation because from Monte Carlo simulation, this seems to be uh, more natural and more efficient. The theta, the phi function, so like I mentioned, is defined as the integral of a theta s. And of course, we remember that theta s, it's a function just like in a single whole white model, it's a function of zero coupon bonds. So this uh, integral, you can even further uh, simplify. Uh, and this is what I just mentioned, that if you transfer, if you move from one model representation to the other model representation, you have to keep in mind that the meaning of the parameters may be different. So if somebody tells you there is a correlation under 2D full-wise model, this correlation will be different in this model 
as in this model. Then you have to look at the correlation. This correlation actually will be almost the same, except that there will be some adjustment which takes into account volatilities and, and uh, uh, yeah, the volatilities and time of the two of the two. But this is just a, a mathematical fact. Okay. Um, how this function, how to um, perform zero coupon bond pricing, because what we are interested in at the end, we would like to have this affine form. We have a fine form of the uh, of the full white two factor model, and we would like to simulate yield curve for given realizations. So for this representation, we can already simulate the paths. But of course, if you are interested in getting yield curve or yield implied from the model, we need to have zero coupon bonds because from here, what we will do at the end, we will calculate. So it's a zero coupon bond P T T. We will have an E minus R T minus T. So from here, we will imply R and R will be our effective on continuously compound yield that we will simulate using Monte Carlo. So of course, it's a crucial that we have close form representation for the zero coupon bond from which we will compute the yield. And nicely, um, nicely for zero coupon bonds for the whole white two factor model, uh, expression is still analytical as expected actually, because we added additional Gaussian process to our system of uh, SDEs. So that does not complicate matters so much. And it's again a nicely enclosed form. So you see there is a, a PM and this means here we have this market dependence. So this and these zero coupon bonds, those are the zero coupon bonds that you calculate from your yield curve. So this is, let's say, market input. So this is the generated from the market or calculated from the market quotes from the yield curve. And then we have an exponent. We have a half of the so-called variance. So variance is a, a complicated expression, but still closed form uh, of all the model parameters. Also correlations between brown emotions, mean reversions, volatility, and so on. And only we have to keep in mind that we have this uh, TT, zero capital time T, uh, zero small time T. And we have also function Psi. And this function Psi depends on, okay, model parameters, mean reversion again, and the paths itself. So if you look at it, it's basically zero coupon bond under two, a two factor whole white model, we can express it as E and then we will have A plus uh, B times X T plus, it's nicer, should write a bit nicer here, this will be X plus we have C times Y T. So you see, this is essentially the same uh, representation as we had for the whole white model, except now we have this additional term involving second factor. So this is, uh, uh, again, uh, just an extension of the single factor whole white model. Okay, so if we would like to simulate Gaussian two factor model, uh, essentially we are simulating a sum of two mean reverting processes and function which corresponds to the term structure and this function is phi t. Uh, and this phi t function is not the same as theta we have seen for the full white model because now we are talking about Gaussian two-factor model. Uh, this phi t is slightly different because it involves, involves also the second factor that we were uh, we was not present in the single factor model. But again it's very similar form because we have instantaneous forward rate so the one we calculate using market data and then we have uh, few expressions for the volatilities for two uh, SDs. And also we have the correlation coefficient, uh, which corresponds to the correlation of two Brownian motions. And again, as before, uh, instantaneous forward rate is defined as the minus logarithm of the zero coupon bond from the market calculated from the curve. And then it, that's differentiated respect to time. Again, keep in mind that this is zero. This means that this is as seen from today. So if you have a yield curve with a phone today, that would be a proper zero coupon bond with this maturity T. Another important point regarding Gaussian two-factor model or whole white two-factor model is the relation between the processes. I have already mentioned that process X and process I are correlated, and there is a correlation rho between brown, corresponding Brownian motions. Uh, in practice, we know that uh, from the simulations, we can see that process X is typically associated with the level of the yield curve. So this would be our level. And process Y corresponds to the skewness, uh, steepness of the skewness of the curve. So this tells you how steep is the the yield implied from that model. 
Uh, after calibrating the model, uh, we see also that from the micro experiments performed in uh, real market data, we see that typically there is a large negative correlation. So the correlation here rho between brown emotions from X and Y, it's a very, very strongly negative, which that indicates there is a steepening of the curve tends to correlate negatively with the parallel move of the forward curve. So this is something implied from the market. So if we have a, a parallel movement of the curve, that's negatively related to the steepening of the curve. So this is something that we also, actually correlation or this sign of this behavior of the curve is implied directly from the market data. So this is just an observation uh, that let's say market imposes on this model. Let's take a look now at the correlation between bonds. So for Hulu-White single factor model, we have observed that if we have two bonds with different maturities, correlation between yields, corresponding yields, is one. Let's now uh, check uh, the same, uh, let's say, apply the same check for the Hulu-White two factor model. So for Hulu-White two factor, we have, as we had for single factor, so we have this nice, elegant, affine form. And I think I have here again, there is a typo here, so this will should be uh, here one, and this should be two. So, so we have a, a, a fine form for two bonds. So we have a P T T one, A B and C, and we have a two risk factors X and Y, and the same here. So it's the same risk factors, however, functions A B and C because there is a different maturity. Those will be different. Uh, this typo that you will see, it will be adjusted in the slides. So if you download the slides from uh, from the website, uh, this will not be there anymore. But what we do next, what we just apply the same technique as we have done for the full white model. We take a logarithm and then scale it with, uh, with the time effect. And then what we have here is that uh, the, the rate that we have uh, will be because we have this, uh, we are applying again this formula that I mentioned before. We have T capital time T. We have a E minus R T minus T. So this is the formula we are going to use. And of course, for this expression, we apply this formula, which is here, right? And the same for this bond. So we substitute and then we find out what is R corresponding yield uh, from T to T1 and T to T2. And this is the expression we have. So we see that now, again, we have this uh, nice representation. So the exponent is gone. Uh, time effect is not so much important. However, if you look at the correlations between these two rates, so if you look at the correlation between R, T, T1 and R, T, T2, so these two, to check the correlation, this correlation will be uh, given also, again, as we have seen before, with uh, X and Y. Uh, and here we have also X and Y. However, because we have this uh, B1, C1, B2, C2, those are different functions, then this correlation is not equal anymore to one. This is a property of the correlation function. So this is something, uh, it confirms that by adding additional factor to the whole white model, uh, we have desired feature. So this means that we can actually see uh, uh, the correlation between bonds, as we would expect to see them from market, uh, it's not the same anymore. It's not equal to one. And this is what we will explore later in this course. But this is the, the first and very important requirement that extension of the one-factor model to two-factor models satisfies. Um, somebody could ask the question, what if we add more factors? So if, instead of having two factors, we would have three factors, five, and so on. Uh, and that will not give you so much improvement by adding additional factor from one factor to two factors, we really gain something uh, important. And this something, the element which is very important is this correlation and implied volatility thump. So this is, let's say, if you look for the interest rate uh, implied volatilities, by adding two factors, second factor, we can have a more realistic implied volatility shapes uh, when we talk about the pricing of caps. So this product we are going to discuss later in this course. Uh, however, by adding more factors, these benefits are very much limited. Uh, on the other hand, by adding more factors to the model, we increase the complexity because at the end, we need to calibrate all those parameters. So maybe you remember, we had these expressions uh, with, um, we have multiple mean reversions, we have two mean reversions, we have correlation, and we also have volatility. So all those parameters need to be imp implied from market data.
We, however, we have this, let's say, market dependent function. So whatever parameters you will choose, we always have the same because this model belongs to the AJM framework. We will always be able to recover yield curve. So that's perfect. However, we have still uh, multiple parameters that we can calibrate to the market data and more parameters we have, uh, more difficult it becomes to calibrate. Uh, and this comes from the problem, uh, the perspective of the calibration routine. Uh, more unknowns we have, that's typically uh, more problematic to solve. On the other hand, uh, even if we uh, would have hundreds of parameters for the Gaussian, say, 50-factor model, um, we are not going to, by adding more factors, uh, the flexibility in terms of implant volatilities it's very limited. So we cannot really see the gains anymore of uh, adding more factors because simply this model uh, does not have stochastic volatility. So this means that we can maybe generate a skew. So full white model also full white two factor or three factor generate skew, but we'll be never able to generate any smile, which is could be present in the market. This means that by adding millions of parameters, this limitation still preserves. Later in this course, we discuss this, how this implied volatility for whole white and whole white two factor can be calculated. Uh, but this is, I would say, at this point, the most important uh, takeaway. Uh, next point, what we are going to do, as we have done for the uh, single factor model, we are going to sim perform the simulation where we simulate paths. So we have uh, uh, our two factor model, we simulate paths. I think this will be until, again, 10 years. And at this point, for this realization, so at this point, uh, actually, you can see here, it is maybe not so much realistic picture because uh, we will have two paths. We have one process for XT, and also we have process for YT. But this is just to illustrate, we have a, a RT here, given this form, XT. So this is YT. We have plus, plus also function Psi T. So we will simulate this RT, and then we will look at the yield. And the same would be for this scenario and the same for this scenario. This would be this, exactly the same experiment as we have performed for whole white single factor model. And now we will be checking how this yield curve, um, yield implied from a, a whole white two factor model, how it is affected by this additional correlation coefficient and, for example, volatility. So we have a eta or we have sigma one, sigma two parameters. So whether we can actually see something more than just parallel shift of the uh, yield. Uh, and this is the result. So before we go dive into Python code, uh, this is illustration what we have seen already for single factor full white model. So we see that by changing actually for every scenario, we only see uh, a yield implied from the model, uh, which is just a parallel shift. However, for a full white two factor model, so we have two factor model here, you see those yields are not anymore just a parallel shift. And this comes from this impact of the correlation we have seen. This is the correlation that we have, and also the parameters for the second factor that we could control this additional. You see, there is, for example, here it's crossing. Uh, here is this, there's some crossing happening. So if you have a path which is higher than the previous path, it does not mean that your yield implied from the uh, model will be the same, uh, or it will be just higher, it will be parallel shift we can see there is something happening and that is especially from the risk management you prefer to simulate scenarios which are uh, not just a single parallel shift because that's a very simplistic scenario so if somebody would say what yield curve can be in 20 years and you would just today take today's yield curve and add 20 basis points or five percent does not seem to be very realistic uh, stressed or any scenario. However, if you have a model that allows you also to observe the dynamics of the curve, that some rates could be higher, some rates could be lower, that can give you indeed uh, good insight into uh, your profile of your uh, portfolio for those scenarios. It could be, for example, that your portfolio in particular is sensitive to shapes of a yield curve. Yeah? So this could be also uh, the case. Okay, so let's take a look now at the uh, uh, Python code. So in this Python code, uh, so let's start from the main function. Uh, again, we have 2000 paths. This is the configuration whole white one factor model. So this is what we have done already for, uh, uh, we have done before. Here we have also second factor. So let's make a correlation there. 
minus 10 percent minus 20 percent here i have defined uh, market data so those are the spine points zero coupon bonds from the market and to interpolate what i have done here we have defined a b spline curve so i defined b spline interpolation between those points uh, in the full white model i have done slightly different i have done uh, interpolation on the log space here I change it slightly just to for the illustration purposes. Uh, as I already have mentioned multiple times, uh, choosing of interpolation is an art. Uh, however, it's very important uh, element once you talk about modeling of a yield curve. Um, in two lectures, we'll be discussing uh, yield curve construction. Then I will give you more details on how to choose different interpolations, what is the impact of particular interpolation on your results, and how, how to look at it, and uh, uh, what where are the uh, pitfalls and uh, uh, how to make sure that your uh, interpolation is uh, close to or is uh, realistic in some sense. Uh, that will be discussed in two lectures. So here what I'm doing here next, so once we have this zero coupon bonds with an interpolator, so this means that for every maturity we can get zero coupon bonds. And that's important because we are going to generate this term structure uh, function phi or function theta in the whole white and whole white two-factor model. Um, we have uh, we will be looking at the 20 uh, zero coupon bonds. So in this line here, we uh, define a grid for zero coupon bonds. So this first part of the code that I'm using here is to look at the uh, zero coupon bonds generated from calculated from the market against zero coupon bonds, as you can see, calculated from the whole white model. So there is no uncertainty. It is just a, a double checking whether yield curve zero coupon bond curve generated from the market or generated from the model uh, covers or is the same as the one as the input if that would be not the case this means we already have a problem so there's no point even further to look at your uh, uh, the code so there is no completely no uncertainty we have r0 you can see here and we have uh, you see for x and y in the whole y two-factor model those are simply set to zero those are the initial values so here we also have uh, zeros Let's take a look maybe at this uh, two-factor full white function. It is simple. It's you see, it's very uh, it's closed form. So we have this lambda expression for the variance that we have seen in on the slides. We have a, a, a phi function. Uh, so this is integral over phi. This is also in closed form, and then we have uh, this affine representation for zero coupon bonds. So we have uh, integral phi, and then we have uh, a x t one. B, Y, T1, those are the path realizations, those, so the, those are the inputs, and then we have half of the variance. So this is just the formula we have seen in the slides to generate zero coupon bond once we have paths for X, Y, X, T1, X, T2, and we give some uh, time T1 and T2. So this is the uh, uh, start point of a bond, zero coupon bond, and maturity of the bond. And of course, this will also depend in some sense from the yield that we give as an input. So this is the market yield as seen of today. You remember uh, the expression for the uh, for zero coupon bonds also dependent on market yield, uh, zero coupon bonds calculated from today's curve. And so this is the zero coupon bond curve. It is an input. Okay, uh, so this part, first part, first figure, we will be comparing uh, uh, zero coupon bonds from the uh, model versus the market. This will be done for two models. Uh, then we have here, um, so this will be just uh, zero coupon bonds. Then we go into Monte Carlo path. We simulate paths until 10 years. And then from this 10 years, we will start generating yield curve uh, for another 40 years. So we see it's a T end is 10 years. And then we have T end two, which is uh, 10 years plus 40 years. So it's a, from 10 years from now, we will generate yield, cur yield curve for another 40 years. So it, Overall, it's 50 years from today's date. So what we do here, uh, we have, uh, uh, this is for the single factor case, um, because I would like to compare, make the comparison between single factor and two factor models. So this piece of code we already have seen, we generate for, uh, we first, we take last vector of the simulated paths, and for every path, we calculate yield. So this is yield here, which is, uh, uh, minus log of zero coupon bond, and then we have this cool function, and then we perform this plotting of this uh, uh, of this yield. So this is for the single factor model, and now we simulate uh, two factor model. 
where we just perform again simulation of uh, x, y, and r. And then we will use, actually, we are not going to use r anywhere because what we are interested in, we, our representation of zero bond bon, bot is in terms of x and y. So this is what we see here. We have, uh, uh, in this case, we calculate zero bond bonds for lambda, lambda 2, eta, eta 2. So those are the volatility functions. Correlation, today's yield curve. Uh, T end, so this is 10 years. Tj is the one which is 11 years and so on until uh, year 40. And then we are evaluating zero coupon bonds at uh, pairs. So we look at the height, the pair, pair path xt and also yt. Because you remember, you have to take them those values in pairs. You cannot take uh, x fixed and y is changing because we have correlation between x and y. So this is important that we always, this index for taking pair paths from x and y, it's corresponding. And then again, we just calculate the yield and we plot this yield. So let's perform the simulation. So let's look at the results first, those results. So here we compare zero coupon bond curve uh, from the uh, market. And so it's got analytical. Then we have a zero coupon bond from the full white uh, single factor. And we also have uh, with dots, black dots, zero coupon bond curve from two-factor model. This figure represents a yield. So this is simply a yield implied from the curve. Uh, so we can see in initially yield curve is very low. The yield that we will get over investment in zero coupons is very low. And then it gets up and then indeed further goes down. This is a result we have seen already for full white single factor model. So we simulated only 10 years and we see those parallel shifts. This is what we get now for a two-factor model. So we see that there is some interactions between paths, uh, uh, yields are crossing, and this is definitely much more realistic and richer than the presentation here. Uh, maybe a small remark here. If you look at the scales, so uh, you see it's a 0 0.04, for example, here we have a 0 0.4, this is 0 0.6. So you see the, 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 the wideness or the volatility here is larger than here. Maybe not so much large, but it is larger. So if you, uh, and the reason for that is that we have chosen whole white model parameters for the one factor, and then we just added two factor uh, parameters. So you see overall volatility has increased because we have added extra volatility factor. So in order to make it maybe much more fair comparison, um, then we will need to make sure that we, essentially we will need to recalibrate our model so that to make sure that the variance of both single factor and two second factor model variances are the same. That will be maybe more fair comparison. However, that would not change the overall picture on the dynamics and the impact of different of the second factor on yield, which we can generate from the buffs. And I think this is the most important takeaway. So if we add extra uh, factor Gaussian in a Gaussian two-factor model, we can expect to have a much more realistic dynamics of a yield generated from Monte Carlo simulation. And this is, I would say, the most important takeaway. Now it's the time to summarize what we have learned in today's lecture. I have shown you how to find solution for the full white model. Uh, so maybe the most important takeaway is that in the finding of the solution, we have to start with a certain variable y, which is properly scaled. And that happened to be very beneficial if you want to, uh, if you wish to find a solution for the uh, whole white model. Uh, then I related the whole white model to the affine jump diffusion class, which was um, discussed in some depth in the computational finance course. And I have shown you how to relate zero coupon bonds uh, from the affine models, how to relate them to the characteristic function. So in, to summarize, uh, if we have a model which is affine or short rate, which is affine, this means it's linear in terms of uh, state variables, we are able to find the characteristic function. And in that characteristic function, if we choose the U argument, so the Fourier argument to zero, that allows us to find zero coupon bond. Uh, in the whole white model on the simple models, the zero coupon bond will be given analytically, but typically it, it involves solution of a Riccati type of equations. For details, I would recommend you to take a look in the book or to revisit a computational finance course. Uh, then I started with a small, uh, we had a brief look at the yield curve. What is the yield curve? 
uh, how it's built, what are the types of uh, milk shapes. And this was just a brief introduction because we will have a whole lecture dedicated to uh, construction of a yield curve and how to further and deeply understand what is happening uh, in the building of the yield curve, which is implied from different market instruments. And that will be discussed in two lectures from now. Then we move to the limitation. So we are very excited about the whole white model. I already mentioned that whole white is kind of Ferrari or short rates are Ferrari models. But I also have shown you why this model maybe uh, have some limitations. And the limitations, of course, uh, as discussed, was the, the correlations between bonds with different maturities. Uh, and also the limitation is that the model has only few parameters. So that does not allow us to calibrate to whole volatility surface. We can only calibrate to some uh, instruments present in the market. Uh, as the solution for that, so maybe as the solution for this uh, zero correlation, uh, we have discussed extension to two-factor model, which allowed us to release this assumption or release this constraint of a perfect correlation between uh, zero coupon bonds. And now it's the time to summarize. So I've just summarized. So now we go into homework. I have preferred, uh, prepared two exercises. The uh, first exercise is, is 11.1 from the book. You can find the solution online. Uh, and this exercise is about uh, uh, finding expectation. So this is the representation of the whole white model under the T forward measure. This is what we will, uh, uh, what you have. So the, the idea here is to apply your knowledge uh, uh, from the lecture number two, where we talk about measure changes, and also dive a little bit in the calculations of expectations and uh, and the variance. Uh, I think in here I'm not asking to find these dynamics. We will be discussing it later, uh, but you have to calculate mean and the variance for this process. Keep in mind that this is actually so uh, in a AJM, original AJM framework, uh, whole white model is defined under risk neutral measure. Here we are talking about a forward measure, and this forward is associated with the zero coupon bond T, T2. And that would be uh, later important that this maturity here corresponds to this measure, because then we'll be using this uh, transport processes to pricing options on zero coupon bonds that will actually mature at this point. So imagine with a call option, like for a stock, but then underlying is the zero coupon bond. But that will be discussed in the next lecture. So this is the first exercise. It's rather straightforward. I hope that you can also, you have to also make some transformations as we have done in this, uh, in this lecture. And the second exercise is uh, uh, using uh, Laplace transform. Uh, you have to show the following expectation. So it's a little bit of uh, algebra. I hope you enjoy it. I didn't make it too difficult today. A more difficult exercise will be later in this course.